So Carol and I were on a trip to Minnesota the uh, last several weeks. We've been back for just over a week. Uh, and uh, in the middle of that trip, we, we did my favorite vacation, which is a canoe trip into the Boundary Waters. Uh, and on the excuse that you don't want to carry any extra weight when you're portaging, uh, I don't take a razor with me, and I just let it grow. <laughs> uh, and, and I almost left the goatee on under the mask, but I decided I'd take it off. <laughs> I, I was hiding it under the mask for a while there after I got back. Uh, I, I always enjoy that trip. Uh, I, I have never really fully understood why I like it as well as I do. <laughs> But uh, I, I think part of it has always been that uh, when, when we started going there, it was always outside of contact. Cell phones didn't exist when we started going to the Boundary Waters. So when you paddled out, you left society behind. So the troubles of the world can't follow you out there, uh, which I find that nice. I find that nice. Nowadays, some parts you can get cell service. One year we camped where we could see the cell tower, just right over there. Uh, but uh, I think that's part of why I enjoy it. Uh, part of it, I just enjoy the peace and quiet. Part of it was that I used to be scared of canoes. Who would want to flip a canoe and drown, right? So I was scared of canoes. They're, they're, they're tippy little things, right? But then I took a class in college and learned how to canoe properly. And when you know what you're doing, it's not that hard to make a canoe do what you want. Uh, we have never tipped a canoe accidentally. <laughs> now I say that with tongue in cheek because there was a time when I thought Carol understood that I was practicing flipping a canoe and getting back in in a full canoe and whatever. And, and, and I thought that I had cleared with her that I'm going to do that now, but she did not understand that. I was just talking about theoretical stuff. So when I flipped it, she was completely unprepared for the concept. <laughs> uh, so uh, it, it was a surprise to her, but not to me. I, I've enjoyed those trips. And, and uh, have lessons I might share one with you someday from that. Um, I, I just want to have another little prayer before we get into the word. Lord, thanks for giving us your word, for your promise that your spirit will guide us as we open it together. And think about the lessons you have for us in Jesus' name. Amen. The part of the scripture reading that I think will key in to what I'm going to share this morning is verse 31. Verse 30, Jesus comes on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. God sends out, Jesus sends out the angels to gather his people together to him when he comes, and their part in the second coming, is gathering everyone together. Uh, back in 2010, most of you will probably remember when there was a cave-in at a mine in Chile, and 33 miners were trapped in there for 69 days. The longest anyone had ever been had ever survived and been rescued successfully was like 55 days before, and they went another two weeks past that before they were successfully rescued. The, the structure of their mine was a, a spiral of ramps down into the ground, turn after turn, going another level deeper with each turn, and then on one side of this spiral was where the layers, the, the, the veins of ore were for silver and gold. And a number of turns down, there was a collapse in the mine that cut off the, the 33 below that. Now they tried to get through the air passages past that cave in, 
And if the ladders that were in, supposed to be in the air passages for escape purposes had been there, they could have done it. But the ladders weren't there. So they couldn't get out. And a couple of days later, another collapse, a level up or down from the previous one, cut off the air shafts. And there was no chance that they were getting out that way. They tried big equipment to try to dig in, but all of the material was loose. Uh, and everything they did shifted things more, and they were afraid they were just going to make it worse, trying to, trying to dig through. And so they decided, they, they didn't know at this point if the guy survived or not, but they decided, we're going to drill, and we're going to try to hit where they're at. Now, that's drilling from 2,500 feet above at the surface, <laughs> trying to hit a tunnel, and the first few never hit a tunnel. The, the maps they had were old and, and a little loose on their coordinates, and uh, besides that, the rock was hard and the drills would wander on them, and, and hitting a predicted spot wasn't all that easy, and the first few were just plain misses, and then they hit a spot that opened into a, a, a void, and they thought, yes! No signs of life, nothing. A few days later, they hit another spot. Now, these 33 miners were there for 17 days before they were discovered and made contact and finally broke through with a drill. But those first drills were like five, six-inch drills. You can send some stuff up and down. You can drop a wire down, but you can't get a person through. They're still going to be there for a while after that. Day 17, the, the, the miners had been hearing the drilling around them. <laughs> they missed. <laughs> they, they could hear the drilling. They could hear it getting closer. And they, and they had talked among themselves, and, and they had organized themselves quite nicely. They actually had a, 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 a refuge spot, a shelter down where they were that had some food in it. But it was only about enough food for two days for the guys that were there. So what they did was they knew this was going to be a while. Because <laughs> they couldn't get out. And it's going to take them a while to either dig in or whatever they're going to do. It's not going to be quick. So they decided they had to ration their food. They ate one meal every other day. And they stretched the food for two weeks. They made 14 days on the food. And on day 17, a drill bit came through Whew, man, were they happy. But they've been thinking about what happens when the drill bit comes through. How do we let them know we're here? They found us. So they tapped on the drill bit. And being a continuous metal uh, shaft screwed together, the guys at the top could hear the tapping. And then they had a note already written, which they used some tape they'd salvaged and taped it to the end of the drill bit. And when they pulled the drill bit up, there's a note. And it says, Estamos bien en el refugio los treinta y tres. That is, sorry for the poor Spanish. We are well in the shelter, the 33. And the guys on the surface knew. Some of the guys had been high in the mine, above the collapse, and they got out fine. Everyone below the collapse was accounted for. They're all there. They're all alive which is good news, but you can't just pull them out a six-inch hole. <laughs> what they could start doing is sending food down and, and uh, things of that sort that they needed. I think they had some water down there, but you can send them clean water. Uh, they eventually dropped a line with a video camera, could see the guys down there. Uh, and, and so they started uh, getting back to uh, some nutrition. But now how do you get them out? Now that we know where they're at, so they had three big drilling rigs, drilling from different places, but they're drilling at an angle. Usually you want to drill straight down. It's much easier drilling straight down. The trouble was that straight above where they were is the unstable ground that has already collapsed, and if you put a big heavy rig up there jiggling all the time, you're just going to cause more collapses. And your tunnel that you drill, your borehole, will probably collapse on you too. So they had to start off to the side and drill in at an angle uh, to hit the spot where they were. And they had three different ones. 
Uh, two of them followed the five or six inch hole as their guide and just made it bigger. Nice big hole that you could pull a capsule with somebody back up. The, the third one was just drilling straight through the raw rock uh, and, and it turned out that, that they had plan A, B, and C and plan B was the one that broke through first. Uh, they, they got the hole and, and then it was a couple of days of, of rigging the top of the hole with, with piping so that the loose rock at the top doesn't fall into the tunnel and jam the capsule halfway up or something like that. Really, you don't want that. And, and there's a lot of spots along the way where you're going to have rock with cracks in it, which when you drilled may have left pieces that when you start pulling the capsule up and down may fall out. So they had to design a capsule that had a reinforced top on it in case a rock falls. Uh, it had lighting. It had audio and, vi and video communication to the surface when they're pulling it up. And it also had a trap door in the bottom. So if the capsule gets stuck halfway up, the guy in it can open the trap door and let himself back down to the tunnel where the other guys are. So he's not stuck forever halfway up a little hole that only one guy can get into. Uh, they, they thought it all out pretty carefully. And, and so uh, they, 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 they did a couple trial runs uh, you know, testing it. They, they tested a lot during the days they were drilling, but in the hole itself, they lined the top of the tunnel, uh, the bore, with, with steel pipe, got all of the winch and everything ready, and then they lowered the capsule all the way to the bottom, except about the height of the tunnel down there. They, they left 15 feet short of the bottom because they didn't want the guys at the bottom trying to get in. <laughs> they weren't ready for that yet. They weren't ready. They were just testing the hole. So they stopped a little short, pulled it back up. The next run, they sent a rescue guy down, first thing. Because he knows how the capsule works. He knows how to strap in. He can explain it all to you. He can manage the, the boarding process at the bottom. At first, they were going to send three rescuers down without taking any miners out. So they had a full crew of, of uh, supervisors down there for the rescue. But when they got down the first time, it went nice and easy. And they said, why are we sending an empty run? Let's put somebody in it and start getting them out. So they did. Uh, and and they, they brought a couple more rescuers down right away on the next couple of runs. Later in the process, they brought more rescuers because the whole thing took uh, about 24 hours to get everybody out. And the rescuers are not alert and, and need some rest and need to take turns, so they sent replacements down. Uh, they, they brought up first the most alert and, and sharpest guys down there, the first four or five. They said, we want to know what the trip was like up and down. How was it? Uh, and anything we need to know about how the guys are doing and everything else. So they, they brought them first. Then after that, they brought the sickest first, the ones who were weakest. Everybody was in reasonable condition. But some of them had health issues and blood pressure and diabetes. Who knows what all they had? Uh, but they had issues. And so the, the most vulnerable came first. And the last miner out was the foreman of the crew. He said, I'm not going till last. I will not go till last. He was the last of the miners out. And then the uh, kind of the postscript, they pulled up the six uh, rescuers that had gotten down there by then, uh, put a cap on it, and they were done. It was a great story of a successful rescue. And I can't help thinking of parallels between us in this world and them trapped in that mine. And our rescue comes from above. And I think it's also interesting that the first one to make the traverse comes down. He comes down first and makes it possible for us to come back up.
similar lessons, but a completely different setting. Philippine Islands, World War II. Elder Paul Eldridge and some others that I knew when I was a kid in Academy in Singapore and back in the 70s had been missionaries uh, in the Philippines when World War II broke out and the Japanese invaded the Philippines. At first, life went on pretty much as it had. But slowly and steadily, the, the Japanese began curtailing what missionaries were allowed to do. And eventually, they brought all the foreigners together into a concentration camp, essentially a prison camp, uh, and put them all in there. Um, when they were taken to the camp, they couldn't take very much with them. Uh, and Elder Eldridge said he had just gotten three brand new tailor-made suits. And, and that was significant money to him in those days. And in those days, pastors wore a suit all the time. Every day. Oh, one of our pastors in, in Minnesota, his dad had been a missionary in Egypt, and he talked about his dad changing the tire on the car with the suit and tie and coat. Right? <laughs> you, you just wore a suit all the time. And so he's got these three brand new suits, and he's going to use them when this war is over. So he took them to camp with them. Um, Elder Eldridge had previously been a missionary in Japan, so he knew Japanese fluently. And he became the liaison, the contact person, with the Japanese camp commander. Uh, this was a, a civilian detainee camp, I guess you'd call it. They were not prisoners of war. And so they set up their own organization and were free to do kind of what they wanted within the camp. And the Japanese controlled the perimeter. You've got to stay there. <laughs> They're guarding you, uh, but you get to kind of run your daily lives the way you want. And Elder Eldridge became the, the contact person to the camp, Japanese commander from the prisoners. Um, they were at a former school campus on the shore of a large lake on the, on the island of Luzon in the Philippines. And, and each family got about 12 square feet, which is probably roughly like the first four rows on, on one side here. Roughly. It might not be quite that generous, but close to that. And, and for privacy... You could hang sheets. <laughs> These were classrooms, gymnasiums, whatever. They all got divided out into places where people were staying. Uh, and uh, every morning, uh, as part of their daily routine, they had a roll call outside. Everybody's there, and we, we, we call roll. Uh, and that was at 7 o'clock. And you knew it was 7 because the bell always rang at 7. There was an Englishman there who was very punctilious. And he would stand there with his watch in his hand, ready to strike the bell at exactly 7 o'clock. He would ring that bell. Everyone, ding, right at, right at 7. He would ring that bell. They could supplement their food by buying food at the gate of the camp from local people. They bring the food up to the camp gate, you go out and buy food from them. You're not free to go out there, not free to come in, but you can come together at the gate and you, you can do your trading there. Uh, and Elder Eldridge said they also could plant some little gardens. They had little spaces that they could use for gardening. Uh, and his family planted something that's related to a sweet potato. Not for the potatoes, but for the greens. So they could get some vitamins and minerals and, and some fresh green stuff to eat. They had, they had very, very limited personal belongings with them. And he had three kids in his family. Their only toy was a wagon 
that dad made for them out of scraps that he could come up with. Nails, you know, boards nailed together to make the, the wagon and boards for the axles with nails for the wheels to turn on. <laughs> you can guess there might be a little maintenance involved in this. <laughs> Probably every day you kind of straighten it up so it can go again. It was a pitiful thing, he says. It was a pitiful thing, but it was the only toy they had, and his kids loved that wagon. I mean, they, they, that was their thing, and they, they truly loved their wagon. You weren't supposed to have any communication equipment to connect to the outside, but somebody had a crystal radio. I don't know for sure who had the radio, but one of my other friends, Paul Lee, told me about his dad being uh, asked to come over into the area where somebody else stayed, and, and when he sat down, the other fellow pulled out a headset from under the bed and plucked it on his ears, he had a crystal radio. He was listening to the Armed Forces broadcast, Voice of America, some American broadcast. And they, they knew that the war was turning in the favor of America and against Japan. And they could track as the, um, as the American forces moved up the island chains from down near the equator, making their way up closer and closer to the Philippines, ultimately on toward Japan. And as the Americans got closer and closer, and as the Japanese fortunes in the war went down more and more, the camp commander, the Japanese commander, his attitude got nastier and nastier. He said it, it, it couldn't help but remind him of the passage in Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, verses 11 and 12. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. The shorter the time got, the angrier the Japanese commander got until he finally issued the order, you may not buy any food at the gate anymore. Now, there was food available to buy, people willing to sell it, and they had money available to buy it with. They were just forbidden to do that. And so slow starvation set in. They did not have enough to eat. A number of them did not make it because they starved. And the camp doctor, one of the detainees in his records would frequently write beside the name of someone who had died, they died of starvation. That was the primary cause of most of the deaths that occurred. Finally, the Americans were in the Philippines. There was rejoicing quietly among the detainees. But the progress was slow agonizingly slow. Finally, they made it to Luzon Island, but still, they weren't being delivered. The Americans have to know that we're here, they thought, but they weren't being delivered. And their hopes rose and fell as the weeks passed without deliverance. And finally, a couple of the men who were detainees there said, we're going to make a break for it. Get to the American lines and let them know that we're starving over here. Now, I think what was probably happening in the Americans' minds this is a bit of a guess. They may have known that the prison camp was there. They probably did. 
but they probably thought that they were being treated reasonable, at least given enough to survive on. That's how you're supposed to treat your detainees. They probably thought they were getting that basic treatment. They weren't. People were still dying with American forces just a few miles away. So these guys escaped and brought word of their plight to the American forces. Sometime later, early one morning, still probably late in the night, you might even say. It might have been three or four in the morning. I don't remember exactly, maybe five. They heard a, a distant droning sound of big engines. Kind of sounded like airplanes, but they didn't come or go or you know, didn't pass. Or it just kept droning on and on and on. They were out ready for a line call that morning, 7 o'clock, and the Englishman was there looking at his watch, ready to strike the bell when the planes came over. And the paratroopers dropped out all over the camp. Boy, were they glad to see that. Just a short firefight, and the Americans had control of the camp. Someone came running through the barracks. Get your stuff. Be down at the ball field in an hour, ready to go. Just a few minutes later, a second soldier came running through the barracks. Be at the ball field in five minutes. Bring only your papers and the clothes you're wearing. What changed? They didn't know how many people were there. They, they got it wrong. There was a whole bunch more prisoners than they thought. And they needed all the available space just for the people to get. Oh, by the way, that droning sound, uh, that was the amphibious tanks that had been crossing the lake from the American side to the prison side during the early part of the morning. Uh, so what did they say to bring? Your papers and the clothes you're wearing. Remember those three brand new suits? What a struggle, he said, what a struggle. Finally, he resolved what he would do. He put them all on, <laughs> all three of them, at the same time, in the tropics, in an overcrowded amphibious tank for the long droning ride back across the lake. I gathered from how he tells the story that there were moments where he wondered if that was the smartest choice he'd ever made in his life. It might not have been. Maybe, just maybe, the suits weren't quite worth it. But there was another problem. There was another problem. The wagon. The kid's wagon. Daddy, we've got to take our wagon. Well, we can't take your wagon. But Daddy... We've got to take our wagon. We, we can't. But, Daddy, it's our wagon. You know how that's going to go. Uh, Dad knew what a radio flyer wagon was. And he said, as soon as we get back to the United States, I'm getting you a brand new wagon. They were unconsoled by such a promise. They did not want to leave their wagon. This is their wagon. And they didn't want to leave it behind. <laughs> yeah. See any parallels to our situation at the end of the earth here? Elder Eldridge made them quite clear. The angry captor losing the war who turns his anger more and more at those who do not follow his intentions for them. Signs that the, that the deliverance is coming closer. They, they watched, heard the progression of the Americans through the island chains. They knew when they hit the Philippines. They knew when they were on Luzon Island. They knew where they were on Luzon Island. They knew they were just across the lake. They knew 
And yet, it still went on and on, much longer than they expected. I think we could say that ourselves, can't we? I mean, th there were times in my life I didn't think we were getting out of the 1970s. I really didn't. Uh, at the time, I was a student missionary in Korea. North Korea was tunneling under and doing all kinds of other things and sending commandos down into the south to blow things up, whatever. It was kind of rough over there. And I thought, they're going to start World War III right here, right now. I, I really did. I thought so. Hmm. Suddenly, when it was not expected, it came. And it was over. And they were free. They were delivered and they were safe. And so it will be for us. And those paratroopers, he couldn't help but see the angels who gather God's people together to bring them into Christ's presence when he saw the paratroopers coming down. The devil is angry, he knows his time is short. It's coming soon, but we don't know when. And, and there are stops and starts in our emotions as we watch the signs. It's near, but it didn't happen. It's near, it didn't happen. When Jesus comes, we take less with us. <laughs> it's just us. It's just us. We don't take papers. You don't need papers in heaven. He's going to give us a new road. We don't, know, we don't need the duds from here. All the stuff we have? What happens to all the stuff we have? It's all going to burn. It's all going to burn. I remind myself of that every time I move. <laughs> every time I move. I remember it, it, sitting in Borneo, uh, watching the pile of stuff for the mission family. We went over to help with a mission family over there, the, the Helton Fisher family. And their shipment had arrived, and we were getting it cleared through customs, loading it onto the mission truck, and then going to haul it up to the mission station. And I was just kind of sitting there chatting with one of the guys who, who worked there. Uh, and I remember at some point in this process looking at this pile of boxes and things. And, and it's all good stuff, and it's stuff you're going to use, right? But I remember Helton Fisher saying, this world is too much with us. <laughs> all, the, all the stuff that, that, that life brings along. And every time I move and go through the process of packing, moving, unpacking, sorting, arranging, and all of that, uh, I think of the plan that God uses at the second coming. Just leave the stuff behind, and in a metaphorical sense, throw a match over your shoulder. <laughs> it all burns. It's all gone. But like the little wagon, our heavenly Father knows what radio flyers are. He knows what the good stuff is, that this stuff is only the temporary, cheap, make-do substitute for the real good stuff they got in heaven. We're not going to miss any of the stuff we leave behind when we get there. Once we get there, and see what's there, nobody's going to say, oh, can I go back and get my... <laughs> you won't want to go back and get your whatever. If somebody said, I'll go get it for you, you'd say, don't. I don't want it. <laughs> no, thank you. I'm done with it because we've got the good and the perfect stuff up there. Our deliverance is coming. It is approaching. As we watch things happening in the world around us, we see things. Well, I even see things in our current COVID crisis and, and surrounding stuff that, that resemble some of the pieces that scripture talks about. I'm not convinced it's the peace, but boy, it's, it, it looks like it's related. It looks like it's related. It looks like 
we're moving closer to the finale with some of the stuff that, that's happening now. Uh, we can't take anything with us. It's going to come unexpectedly. We need to be ready. We need to be ready every day. And we need to not cling to the stuff that's here. Use it. It's God's gift to us to use now and be grateful for what he's given us. Uh, we don't have to, to not appreciate or not use what he's given us. But do that with a sense of balance. All this stuff is the paper plates of life used in our time of preparation for heaven. It's just temporary stuff. It's all going to melt back to the elements it's made of and be reused to make the new earth. Uh, in the form it's in, nothing stays here past the, the changeover to the new earth. My prayer is that we will be ready and delighted to see him uh, as the miners were delighted <laughs> to see the first rescuer step out or to step out of the capsule on the upper end. Uh, their, their joy was overflowing, just bubbled out of them. You could see it all over them. They were so happy to be delivered. And the prisoners in the Philippines, so delighted to see those American soldiers and to climb into those droning tanks and roast on the trip across the lake with your three suits on. <laughs> delighted, delighted to be free at last, to be free at last. And that's going to happen. And God's wanting to work on us each and every day to be connected to him so that we will be stepping on board and the angels will be collecting us when Jesus comes back again. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Lord, thank you so much that you love us, that you haven't abandoned us here in this earth, that you have promised that you're coming and we see the progression of prophecy, we see the events of the world around us, we see the evidence that your coming is near. And, and we long for that day, <laughs> that day when we get to toss the masks over our shoulder and let them burn too. The day the whole thing goes back to the way you intended it to be. What a day that will be. We look forward to rejoicing in your presence in that day. In Jesus' name.